As we unofficially kick off the end of summer this Labor Day, cases of COVID-19 are beginning to surge ahead of the fall season when weather may bring Americans indoors and kids head back to school. Welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us tonight is Dr. Jeffrey Gold, UNMC Chancellor and world-renowned doctor. Dr. Gold, let's start with the latest data on how the Delta variant is impacting the country tonight. Well, first off, Christina, let me just wish you and your family the very best of this Labor Day weekend. I hope that you and, of course, all our audience can spend it with their friends and their loved ones and celebrate all of those important things at this time of the year we celebrate. I also would be remiss if I didn't take just a minute to comment that this weekend also marks uh, the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Hard to believe that two decades have passed all of those individuals who lost their lives and all the changes that have occurred in our nation since then, including, of course, the last year and a half of dealing with this COVID pandemic. So let's start off with the graphics and let's look, as we always do, with what's going on across the globe. And what we see is that the numbers continue to rise over 200,000, over 200 million rather, confirmed cases worldwide, over four and a half million confirmed deaths worldwide. And as has been the case for the last several weeks that we've been together, the United States, both the continental US, Alaska, the islands, etc., as well as certain parts of Europe and Asia are still highly infectious with transmission of what is in the United States almost exclusively Delta variant. When we start to look at the numbers uh, across our nation, uh, we see that again, uh, over 150,000 cases uh, per day and over 100,000 Americans hospitalized, which continues to rise, numbers that we haven't seen for at least the last four to six months uh, in the United States. When we look at some of the hot spots, again, uh, the bright orange, uh, red, and purple are areas where we're seeing some of the highest case transmission in the United States. And you may remember it was about a month ago when this was almost exclusively parts of southern Florida, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Arkansas. But now look at the Pacific Northwest. Look at some of the areas of the Great Plains. <clears throat> Even look at what's going on in Alaska and in Hawaii and we're starting to see a significant uptake in what is almost exclusively Delta variant uh, across our nation. When we look at this by state, you see that the U.S. average is almost 50 cases per uh, 100,000 per day, but there are many parts of the country that are more than twice the U.S. average, and there are many parts, of course, that are much less than the U.S. average. Just making the point, though, that our southern states in spite of the fact they've been fighting this now uh, for almost a month with this incredible surge, are still not peaked out, which uh, is concerning, of course, uh, to all of us. If you look at the U.S. trends on cases uh, per 100,000 per day, uh, what you see is that we're seeing significant increase, which has not yet peaked across the United States. And it's not quite as high, of course, as the case peak that we saw uh, in the middle of the winter, but it is continuing to rise at a very rapid rate with an uncertain amount uh, that will occur over the future. When we break this down uh, with a little bit more detail, when we look at hospitalizations, commented a few minutes ago that were over 100,000 Americans hospitalized. That would be 30 uh, Americans per 100,000 per day. But our southern states are seeing the implications of this in hospitalization and in ICU care with more than twice the U.S. average, which is taxing the health care professionals, running out of supplies and equipment, indeed uh, causing not just patients with COVID, but patients who are having heart attacks and strokes, patients who are having motor vehicle accidents or farming and ranching accidents, uh, waiting long periods of time in emergency room, waiting for hospitalization, and of course, uh, waiting for intensive care unit uh, base uh, when and if they need it. 
If you look at the distribution of the variants going back to the very beginning of the pandemic, as we said a few minutes ago, the United States is just about 100% Delta variant. There's a little bit of Lambda variant that's been identified in several states, including our home state here uh, in Nebraska, but the 99 plus percent. Uh, and indeed, if you look across the country, there used to be some variability in the Pacific Northwest. There used to be some variability uh, in the mid-Atlantic part of the United States. But now, whether you're in the southeast, whether you're in the Texas uh, panhandle, or whether you're in the upper Midwest plains, uh, we're almost exclusively Delta variant uh, across the uh, U.S. And of course, when we talk about the Delta variant, I always like to remind our audience that it's somewhere between six and eight times more transmissible than influenza, more transmissible than the original version of the coronavirus, and a somewhat higher incidence of hospitalization and a somewhat higher incidence of case fatality. Now, of course, all that depends on comorbidity, age, and, and other factors as well, but a much more contagious variant. This is a look at our seven-day running average of hospitalizations uh, per day. And as I said earlier, uh, we have now exceeded 100,000 hospitalizations. Uh, it would take us back to March to have had 100,000 hospitalizations uh, in the United States in the very early days of the vaccine breakthrough and the vaccine uh, rollout. Also quite important because a good number of Americans, about 50 percent, are vaccinated. So this is still predominantly a disease of the unvaccinated. We look at some of the distribution of that by state. U.S. average uh, still less than 50 per 100,000. But if it's in Mississippi or Louisiana or Florida, many of those southern states that had some of the earlier outbreaks, uh, we're now seeing that translate into hospitalization and tragically into death of our loved ones, family members, colleagues, and friends. The hospitalization is particularly hitting our intensive care units very hard. Uh, and over the last week, uh, we've been able to tragically report that 20%, one out of every five intensive care units in the United States is now full and has no additional capacity uh, to deal with our rural and our urban needs, uh, not just for COVID, but for everybody that's coming in with chest pain or a confirmed heart attack, uh, stroke or uh, complications of labor and delivery, uh, et cetera. And these numbers continue to escalate, not only in the southern states, but let's see also in the Pacific Northwest, the far west, uh, and indeed uh, in Hawaii and Alaska uh, as well. Just continued overuse of our hospitalizations. And of course, uh, the tragedy of all of this is loss of life. And we see that over the last uh, 30 to 45 days that the case fatality rate has gone up. We're back over 1,000 cases per day every day for the last two weeks. Uh, and that does not seem to be abating. And given the numbers of new cases, given the tremendous pressure on hospitalization, it is unlikely that that curve is going to flatten for some very significant period of time. A lot of uh, cases uh, seeing even as high as 270, 260, uh, 250 cases uh, through parts of Florida, Kentucky, Georgia, uh, other parts of Alabama, Mississippi. Uh, so indeed, uh, while we said the U.S. average was just a, under 50 cases per 100,000 per day over the last week, tragically, some of our rural farming and ranching communities are a lot more. Mm. So a lot to talk about today, Christina, with our audience. I look forward to our questions. Oh, we have a lot of great questions. We've been getting them online. We've been getting them by phone recordings for you. But you know what, I do want to ask about the recent FDA approval of the Pfizer vaccine. Have we seen people actually going out and rolling up their sleeve a little bit more often now that it has been approved? And I also wonder about the Moderna vaccine. How much longer do you think we'll have to wait before that one is also approved fully by the FDA? Yeah, so you know, we actually have some graphics that we can talk about the vaccine rollout in the United States. and so. Perhaps we can just quickly run them through uh, with our audience. 
So there are three approved uh, vaccines in the United States. Two, the Moderna and the J&J Janssen product, the single dose product, uh, have what we call, of course, emergency use authorization. And the Pfizer vaccine has now been fully FDA approved for all individuals 16 years of age uh, and older. And when we start to look at some of the statistics across the United States, you see in the darkest colored states, which of course includes the state of Washington, California, many states in the Northeast, uh, what we see is uh, higher rates of vaccine uh, in fully vaccinated individuals, as high frequently as in the mid to upper 60s. <clears throat> but there are still states in the United States that are much lower than that, that are in the 40s and the 30s. Indeed, as I know our state really well, just by example, there are counties in our state that are 50 to 55, 56 percent vaccinated, but there are also counties that are 12, 13, and 15 percent vaccinated in our parts of the state. And I am sure that that's true in different states as well. Quite a bit of vaccine uh, variability. Uh, in answer to your question, though, Christina, what you see is that of all ages, uh, the U.S. is just over 50 percent fully vaxxed. Uh, when you get to 18 years of age and older, we're just under 65 percent fully vaxxed. And when you get to those that are 65 of ages and older, particularly those in long-term care facilities, uh, we're over 80 percent vaxxed as a nation. And some of our states, including ours, are close to 85, 87, almost 90 percent vaxxed in those age groups, which, of course, are among the most vulnerable individuals. Now, you had asked about the rate of vaccination. Uh, what we see here is that based upon the current rate, uh, we'll get to about 70 percent of the total population in early November, about 85 percent of the total population in February. We won't get to 90 percent till April of 2022. And the current estimations, the current projections, uh, in order to get our hands really wrapped around this virus progression, is that we're going to have to get to between 85 and 90 percent, assuming that there's not another variant and assuming that we don't start to see fall off in the effect of some of the individuals uh, that have already been vaccinated uh, in our country. Uh, if you look at the data state by state, <clears throat> you see Vermont, uh, a uh, very high rate of vaccination, 68 percent fully vaxxed. <clears throat> Massachusetts, Hawaii, Connecticut. Uh, indeed, <clears throat> uh, that part of the country has really been among the early adopters, whereas other parts of the country, unfortunately, are in the low to mid-30s as a state with lower counties. When we look at the vulnerability of our nation, uh, what you see in purple, <clears throat> those are those counties, uh, uh, and indeed, uh, these websites are widely available that look at the percentage of individuals that are not fully vaccinated and the rate of spread of COVID. <clears throat> so the combination of high rate of spread, large percentage of test positivity, and a larger unvaccinated population is what creates this concept of, quote, vulnerability. And you see there's a tremendous a part of the United States, indeed most of the United States, is extremely uh, vulnerable. So I guess uh, we still have uh, uh, a lot of work to do to get these vaccines rolled out. So let's see, we have some questions and uh, I look forward to uh, answering those questions and of course, in the very near future, uh, introducing our very special guest on this holiday weekend. I know, I can't wait to see some of the enhancing imagery that he brought to really tell the story of how COVID-19 and this Delta variant impacts our cells. So we do look forward to that. I want to ask you, I think a lot of people might be at home watching us tonight because maybe they decided it's safer to stay in on this Labor Day instead of going out and getting together in big crowds, even with family and friends. A lot of people right now are concerned about breakthrough cases. How concerned do we need to be? You know, Christina, when we first started talking about the vaccines, even before the clinical trials, were completed uh, last winter. You remember the very first EUA uh, authorizations occurred in December of last year. We knew that a percentage of individuals were going to break through. We, you know, remember uh, even in the very early days, 
the Pfizer and the Moderna products were 95 and 94 percent effective in preventing infection, but almost 100 percent effective uh, in preventing hospitalization and death. <clears throat> Over time, uh, we've seen that fall off somewhat, and then when we became predominantly Delta variant, we started to see higher breakthrough rates. But there is no question that the overwhelming majority, and I'm talking well over 90 percent of individuals that are fully vaccinated with any of the approved products today, uh, are being able to stay out of hospitalization, stay off ventilators, etc. The only exceptions to those have really been, I shouldn't say the only exceptions, but the majority of the exceptions are individuals that are either very young, meaning our very young as children, toddlers, infants, et cetera, that we're now seeing populate some of our children's hospitals. But of those adult breakthrough infections that end up hospitalized, a good number of them are immunocompromised, meaning they're on high-dose medications such as steroids, they're being treated for cancer or for lupus or for rheumatoid arthritis or immuno uh, bowel disease. Uh, or they've had a solid organ transplant or a bone marrow transplant, but for one reason or another, their immune system is not as strong as the average healthy adult, and they're ending up hospitalized. So as we stand today, while those individuals are the prime candidates for booster shots, uh, the rest of us are pretty well protected uh, with these vaccines. Now, having said that, I do think the day is going to come that there'll be a strong recommendation for boosters, at least for senior citizens, those living in long-term care facilities, possibly essential workers such as frontline health care workers, and maybe even everybody at some point. But right now, we're just focusing on the most vulnerable, those with compromised immune systems. Okay, thank you for that. We definitely want to bring you into the conversation now. And our first viewer phone call tonight comes from Paul of South Carolina. Thanks for joining us, Paul. What is your question for Dr. Gold? This has been one of uh, my family's favorite programs for a long time. But I was calling about, uh, I was diagnosed with COVID on December 14, 2020. And I'm still suffering from it. I, I've been vaccinated totally with uh, uh, the two shots earlier this year. But I can't seem to kick a certain breathing uh, problem. I'm wondering who is collecting information, uh, if anybody has some suggestions about how we might deal with this elongated problem. I know it exists and I know it's very difficult uh, to deal with, but I appreciate your comments on it. Second point I wanted to make, a couple of weeks ago Dr. Gold made a comment about the procedures and so forth that uh, were in place when the uh, COVID vaccines were developed and that there was, was promise in those procedures that we might be able to begin to deal with cancer. For decades, I've wanted to get up in the morning and see a headline in the newspaper that says a silver bullet has been found for cancer. His comments of 12 to 18 months out with a possible, uh, not, if not cure, effectiveness uh, in the fight against cancer partially fulfilled my longing to see that headline and I appreciate you saying it and I appreciate you all keeping us up to date on what's going on concerning the current virus. Thank you. Well, thank you, Paul, for your kind words. Really appreciate them. It's an honor and a privilege uh, to address our rural audiences uh, through uh, RFD TV. Uh, I'll answer both of your questions. Uh, the first is I'm really sorry to hear that you're in the long haul group and that you've got some significant medical problems as a result of your COVID uh, infection. Uh, unfortunately, you are not alone. The incidence of long-term uh, complications of COVID, whether it's the so-called brain fog and confusion, fatigue, uh, inability to sleep, or as you're having difficulty uh, catching your breath or uh, exercise tolerance. For instance, I have a friend who's got a 16-year-old son who was a very accomplished high school athlete, got COVID back in April, and has been unable to compete ever since that due to cardiac 
uh, changes. So our advice, my best advice, is get a hold of your local healthcare professional. Probably need some breathing tests. You may need a lung scan and things of that nature just to see exactly what is going on. And then there are some medications. Uh, if there are some elements of either uh, spasm of your airways, there are bronchodilators that may be helpful. And there are different types of other medications that may be very useful. There's also something called pulmonary physical therapy. That is to say, a physical therapy uh, routine that's specifically designed uh, to help you regain normal exercise tolerance and normal lung function. And so there's a lot of good news and things that can happen. Uh, <clears throat> so best advice, uh, contact your local healthcare professional. On the other part of your question is you're absolutely right. Uh, there's a lot of work being done across the United States and around the world using some of these vaccine modalities to not just treat infectious diseases, and indeed I think a lot of our vaccines that we've had previously will be converted to these virus vector and these mRNA types, but to treat other diseases. On one of our previous shows, I talked about a clinical trial that was being done in the Carolinas uh, to treat colon cancer. We've recently initiated some very serious work using uh, an mRNA vaccine to deal with Parkinson's disease. There's some work that's being done across the country to deal with heart failure and certainly other types of cancer as well. There's a suggestion that certain types of retinal disease, eye disease that commonly causes blindness, uh, may be amenable to these vaccines delivery methods as well. So as tragic as this is, as many individuals who have lost and will continue to lose their lives, there's an awful lot of light at the end of the tunnel to not only get through this pandemic, but to use this science uh, in ways that can really save lives and improve the quality of life as well. So my very best wishes to you, Paul, for a speedy recovery. And thank you so much for that call. We are gonna pause for a quick break. Thank you so much for joining us tonight on this Labor Day. When we come back, Dr. James Lawler, co-executive director of the Global Center for Health Security at the University of Nebraska Medical Center and a veteran will be joining us. Stay with us. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Thank you so much for joining us on this Labor Day. Once again, we welcome world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And now joining us tonight, we have a very special guest, Dr. James Lawler, the co-executive director of the Global Health Center for Health Security at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Now, this is why he's important. This is why you wanna stick around for this show tonight. Since the onset onset of the pandemic, he has been widely consulted for his expertise in infectious diseases, pandemics, and health security. Now, he joined UNMC following a military career as a Navy commander and clinical biodefense researcher along the way. He's also served on the staffs of Homeland Security and National Security Councils. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you for your service, Dr. James Lawler. And here is why this is important tonight. You were among the first medical scientists in the U.S. to sound the alarm on the coronavirus. And earlier this summer, your messaging became even stronger with warnings that the more aggressive Delta variant was something that we need to be concerned about. Now, you actually called the anticipated pace of the Delta variant spread a dire warning sign that we may be heading into the worst phase of the pandemic. What makes the Delta variant so different from the original strain of the virus? Well, Christina, there's, there's two components of the Delta variant that make it so much more concerning. And, and it's important for people to realize that it, it is a game changer. It's a very different virus from the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the virus that causes COVID-19 that we were dealing with last winter and, and the previous spring. So it's much more transmissible than previous versions of the virus, at least twice as transmissible as those previous forms were. And it's also able to cause more severe disease. There have been a number of studies showing that the rate of hospitalization the rate of ICU admission, the rate of oxygen use is much higher for people infected with the Delta variant compared to people who were infected with prior versions of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. 
You know, it's really concerning, especially when it comes to children as well. What do we know about children and their susceptibility to the Delta variant? So I, I think that the, the role of kids in COVID-19 is one that many, even public health professionals, have, have potentially um, underestimated uh, until now. So I think if you look back at the, the last year and a half, if, if you do uh, serological surveys, so you look at people's blood for antibodies, uh, we actually find antibodies in more children and adolescents, people between the age of zero to 17, uh, as a percentage than we do in adults, which means that children are at least as likely, if not more likely, than adults to become infected. We generally didn't pick up those infections because we weren't testing in children very much. And so it looked as if children were relatively unaffected by the virus, but, but I think this was probably uh, a miscall because we didn't test frequently enough. Now what we're seeing with Delta variant is children become symptomatic much more commonly now than they did with previous versions of the virus. So when they get symptoms, they're often brought then for testing. And so we're testing children at a higher rate than we were before. But Regardless, what we're seeing with Delta variant now is a much higher rate of infection in children, and unfortunately, a, a, what appears to be a higher rate of, uh, of severe disease and hospitalization. So I'm very concerned that that combination, along with schools now reopening and kids being brought together in classrooms in high density, is going to lead to many more infections in, in children and adolescents. And in addition to uh, the potential danger that that poses to them, uh, they also then serve to bring it back into their homes. And, and so school children are um, an excellent vector, unfortunately, into the rest of the community in uh, amplifying spread. Wow. I mean, that's really concerning. We know everyone's going back to school if they haven't already. And so we all need to be concerned, those of us who do have children, those of us who have grandchildren. We have to think about this. Dr. Lawler, you and your colleagues at the Global Center for Health Security at UNMC recently created a video animation of how the Delta variant enters the body. Let's cue up that video and have you give our viewers an even better understanding of just how the virus invades and hijacks healthy cells. So we have this video that was provided for us by our uh, graphic artists at uh, the IXL Center, and it shows uh, a virus particle, a SARS-CoV-2 particle, entering a respiratory epithelial cell. The cells that line our uh, airways, and uh, once the virus is inside, it, um, it it uncoats and it releases its genetic material, the RNA, which then is turned into proteins by your cell, and those proteins then actually uh, hijack the cell and turn it into a virus factory. And so what you're seeing is multiple copies of the virus now being made by your cell, uh, which will become enveloped, go through uh, the Golgi apparatus to be packaged, and then they are extruded out of the cell. And so this is a good graphic representation of what really happens in your cells when you're infected with COVID-19. Wow, it was fascinating just to see that. I'm sure, Dr. Gold, you enjoyed seeing that as well, even knowing that it was produced at your very medical center. You're doing so many great things there. We're going to go to the phones. Next up is Carolyn from Texas. Thanks for joining us. Carolyn, go right ahead. I am 80 years old. I had COVID back in February before I was able to get a vaccine. After the COVID, my doctor told me to wait three months. And uh, excuse me, after I was diagnosed, then I had the infusion. Then three months later, June the 11th, I got uh, one vaccination. Now I'm wondering what to do after that. Should I have the second vaccination? Should I have a booster? Should I do nothing? Because I've had the antibody infusion and I had COVID and I had one vaccination. Thank you. Well, Carolyn, I think a lot of people are asking that exact question because, uh, first of all, the recommendation to get vaccinated uh, after COVID, uh, anywhere between 30 and 90 days after your recovery, is the routine recommendation. And then, of course, uh, if it's a two vaccine sequence, we're recommending that you complete that sequence. But uh, other suggestions for Carolyn, Dr. Lawler, is what she should do regarding boosters? 
It is a great question, and to be honest, it's one I think that some experts would still debate. What's clear is that after a natural infection, when you get vaccinated, you actually get an additional boost in your antibody levels and potentially your immune protection. And so people who've had previous infection and one dose of the vaccine have antibody titers uh, that are higher than people who've had two doses of the Pfizer or Moderna vaccines. I still think that it's probably a good idea to go ahead and get that second dose because what we don't know is the durability of that immunity. How long will immunity last? And, and booster doses are often important in providing longer lasting immunity. It, it's important to kind of reinforce your immune system uh, to, to remind it of, of what it's been primed against uh, so it retains longer lasting immunity. And, and especially this far out, there's, there's actually been benefit to, to spacing out that booster uh, as, uh, as has been done. So I, I, I think that uh, Dr. Gold is, is right. The, the recommendation to finish the two-shot series is probably the right one. All right. Thank you so much for that phone call. We appreciate it. Our next caller is Paula in Florida. What's on your mind tonight, Paula? I had a question. I took the vaccine and I had a severe adverse reaction, and I'm trying to find out what kind of information is there? How long does it last? Um, and um, what the outcome is? Yeah, I think, Paula, your question about how long it lasts is one that our research scientists here are studying and people are studying around the world. Uh, while we have some data here in the United States, I think some of the best data is actually coming from Western Europe and coming from Israel. Uh, regarding the longevity uh, and not just about whether you're biologically immune, meaning do you have antibodies, but more importantly, what are the reinfection rates, what are the hospitalization rates, et cetera. Uh, Dr. Lawler, what do you think? Uh, what advice would we give Paula in terms of how long we think these vaccines are going to be effective? You know, we talked a little bit about it with the earlier question, uh, but perhaps there's more data you'd like to reference. No, that, that's a great question, Dr. Gold, and, and it's certainly true that we are seeing some waning immunity in people who were uh, among the first to be vaccinated. Uh, but what we're not seeing yet in the U.S. is evidence that the protection against severe disease and hospitalization is waning significantly. And, and so I think the jury is still out about how long um, effective protective immunity lasts, particularly for the more severe manifestations of, of disease. And it, I think it's important to keep in mind that when these vaccines were rolled out, the, the one sacrifice that did have to be made was in the, the time to spend developing um, adequate dosing schedules for these vaccines. There was obviously an urgency last fall uh, to get good immune protection in as many people as we could, as quickly as we could. And once we had the, the safety data that was uh, adequate and, re and reliable and showed that these vaccines were safe, um, the, the plan all along had been not necessarily to do all of the different permutations of dosing schedules and intervals that would give you the best and longest lasting immunity. I think most experts realize that these would be multi-dose vaccines at the end of the day. If you think about the vaccines we give to our kids, uh, many of those vaccines are five-shot series before you achieve really adequate immunity, and then you get boosters uh, every 10 years or so for tetanus, for instance. So I, I think it's true that we are going to have booster shots at some point. Um, but I, I'm not sure what that optimal schedule will be, and it may even vary by age. We're seeing immunity uh, seems to wane a little faster in seniors compared to uh, younger adults, but, but I think that we'll need more data before we really know what the, the schedule is. Again, the good news is, however, that protection against severe disease and hospitalization still seems to be very, very good. Happy to hear that. You know, the great mask debate is on once again. And Dr. Lawler, statistics are showing that virtually all of the sick and dying COVID patients in the U.S. in hospitals are unvaccinated. That brings us back, though, to the topic of masks and vaccines. What does the science tell us about their effectiveness? Are they really the best defense? 
So vaccines clearly are the best tool we have uh, to combat the pandemic and to provide um, community protection against spread, but in part because we have a large segment of the population that's unvaccinated. And we know that the Delta variant is more transmissible and, and we are seeing breakthrough infections and people who are vaccinated can acquire the infection and can pass it on to others. Other interventions that are um, important in slowing spread down in the community, such as face masks, are still important. The, the data on face masks, I, I think, now is unassailable. Uh, the face masks offer excellent protection uh, against uh, acquiring COVID-19 and even better protection uh, to prevent people who are infected and shedding the virus from shedding an the virus into the environment and infecting others. And when you combine those two factors, so when everybody in a community is wearing masks, so that potentially the asymptomatic people who are shedding, uh, we are reducing the shedding coming from those folks, and we're reducing the amount of virus that people are uh, coming in contact with through the masks, that has uh, an incredibly profound effect at, in reducing transmission. Uh, I know there's a lot of debate about what types of masks people should be wearing. Um, to be honest, the most important factor is how well the mask fits and whether you're going to consistently wear it. If you have a, a great N95 mask, but it's not well fit and you're getting a lot of air leakage or it's so uncomfortable that you're not really going to wear it uh, religiously, uh, then you're not any better off. In fact, you're worse off than you would be uh, with a good high quality cloth mask that fits well. We know that those cloth masks, uh, many of them have a filtering efficiency of 80%, uh, which is relatively equivalent to the surgical masks. So uh, find a mask that's comfortable, find a mask that fits well, that covers your nose and mouth, uh, and uh, you will protect not only yourself, but others in your community by, by wearing that mask. All right, thank you for that. I believe we have another video animation from the Global Center for Health Security that shows how the antibodies in vaccines beat back the virus. What can you tell us as you walk us through the science of what we're about to see? What do we really need to pay attention to here? So this illustration is great because it shows how the virus uh, attaches to and gains entry to your cell and how the, the vaccines and the antibodies that you develop because of the vaccines protect you ag against that virus. So the, the virus has uh, a, a series of proteins on, on the outside of it, on the envelope, uh, spike protein, which are uh, the, the mechanism that it uses to bind to the ACE2 receptor on your cell. It's, it's almost like a lock and key, right? It, it's a very tight and specific recognition. What happens is those antibodies that you see swarming in there actually bind to the spike protein uh, and prevent it from attaching to its receptor and gaining entry into the cell. And the more of those antibodies you have floating around, the better your immune response is from the vaccine, the better protected you are. And, and I think to, to point one thing out, what we know now is that prior infection uh, while it may provide a, a small measure of uh, immunity, does not provide adequate immunity against infection with Delta variant. We know now from good studies in the US, uh, one in Kentucky, uh, that show that people who are fully vaccinated have a much lower likelihood of becoming infected with Delta variant than people who had infection with the previous virus. Again, Delta variant is different enough uh, that that prior immunity from previous infection does not appear to be adequate. Mm, interesting. Let's bring our viewers back into this conversation tonight. Our next viewer question is from Elaine in Missouri. What is your question for our experts from UNMC tonight, Elaine? I would like to know if the COVID-19 shots that was given out is down to 39% now. Yeah, I think what you're referring to, Elaine, is uh, some of the reports that over time and with a shift to the Delta variant that some of the vaccines, particularly or even possibly the, the uh, Janssen J&J &J product, uh, has less uh, effect in protecting uh, individuals from getting infected uh, than it did when the products were first rolled out and we were dealing with the wild type or the original type of the virus. And there's no question that over time all of these vaccines do become somewhat less effective. But uh, Dr. Lawler, what do you think? Uh, 
39 uh, percent, probably better than that at uh, this time. I think most of the studies are showing that there's a, a level of protection, a, a vaccine effectiveness that's higher than 39%, even in seniors. Uh, it's definitely true that we're seeing more breakthrough infections with Delta and that the protective uh, effectiveness is less than it was uh, previously for prior versions of the virus. Again, the most important thing, however, is uh, the effectiveness in preventing hospitalization and death still appears to be quite high in all age groups. And, and that bears itself out in what we're seeing in our hospital. The vast majority of cases admitted to our hospital uh, are unvaccinated. They are not fully vaccinated. And in our ICUs, that difference is even more profound. Uh, we have seen almost no patients fully vaccinated who come in uh, and require uh, ICU care unless they are uh, immunocompromised. They have an underlying um, immune disorder or they're on immune suppressing medications that prevent them from mounting a normal immune response to the vaccine. So we are still not seeing people uh, critically ill who are fully vaccinated. So that's good news and it means that the vaccines are working quite well to prevent severe disease. Yeah, and I might add uh, to that, Dr. Lawler, that our population is almost 100% Delta variant right now. And so these statistics about preventing hospitalization, preventing ICU uh, admission, oxygen needs, and of course death, uh, is very applicable across the entire United States. All right, we are going to pause for a quick break. Stay with us. More Rural Health Matters on this Labor Day coming your way right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. Joining us once again, Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And tonight joining us, special guest Dr. James Lawler, the co-executive director of the Global Center for Health Security at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Thank you both for joining us tonight. Our next viewer question comes from Bill in Minnesota. Bill, go right ahead with your question. Hi, this is Bill from Minnesota. I have a brother-in-law that says, I don't believe this, but I have a brother-in-law that says that if you had the Moderna shot, that somebody with a cell phone can hold it up to your arm and tell you that you had the vaccination or not. Um, I just would like to know if he's full of wind or what the deal is. He says that's a way to keep track of you, which I do not believe. Well, Bill, you know, when uh, people tell us that kind of thing or tell you that kind of thing, that's an opportunity to really share the science with them. And as you suggested, it's not true. You know, we've heard so much through social media and through other organizations uh, about microtransmitters uh, that are in the vaccines. We've heard so much about infertility and other problems that have scared off a lot of young women and young men who are either pregnant or thinking about having a family in the near future. And unfortunately, that has created fear in quite a few individuals across our country, which is why we haven't seen the adoption uh, of the vaccines as fast as we did back in April. You know, when we were back in April, uh, we were over 4 million doses of vaccine being administered per day. And about a month ago, we dropped to about a half a million, and we're now at about 850,000 doses being administered per day uh, in the United States. But we're not going to get to a critical amount of immunity at this current rate until next spring. Uh, and so it's a real shame that all of this vaccine hesitancy uh, has occurred. But please, uh, you know, tell your family, tell your friends uh, that cell phones will not track your immune status. Uh, there is nothing in the vaccine other than either fragments of mRNA or fragments of, uh, of virus vector material that are there to create immunity to COVID-19. You know, I love when we get those questions because we all go on social media. We all have family members who bring things up that you need to have a good answer for them when they do so. Mm -hmm. And so I really appreciate you taking those questions head on. And we always just need to be nice and listen to one another when those types of things come up. Speaking of 
reasons why people resisted vaccination. Dr. Lawler, some people resisted for lack of FDA approval. But now that Pfizer has it and Moderna looks like it's not too far behind, where do we stand and where does the U.S. vaccination rate need to be before we hit herd immunity? Is that still something that we should be striving for? Absolutely. And I hope that FDA licensure will prompt some people who were still holding out because of the experimental designation for these vaccines. Uh, I hope that it will prompt them to go out and, and get vaccinated um, right away. So that is our ticket to getting through the pandemic and to limiting uh, the, the number of hospitalized and, and ultimately uh, the number of fatalities that we'll experience now. Essentially, every fatality now, every death from COVID-19 in the U.S. is preventable. And it's, a, it, it's an extra tragedy to see those deaths because we know that they can be uh, prevented with these vaccines. So uh, I, I do think that it's, it's still possible to reach a, a level of vaccination in uh, our population at large that uh, essentially uh, tamps down transmission in the community. But with Delta variant, that proportion of the population probably has to be higher uh, than what it was with the, the original version of the virus. So if you run the math, it's probably around 85% or so of the population needs to be vaccinated before we've achieved that uh, theoretical herd immunity threshold. But the reality is the closer to that number you get, uh, the easier it is to, to manage the virus and, and the less impact it's going to have. Uh, so, for instance, uh, Portugal and Iceland are two countries that have achieved 80 percent community vaccination rates. And, and while they've still seen uh, a surge of Delta variant infections, that surge has been uh, certainly less uh, severe than uh, the surges they had uh, last fall and winter, and their hospitalization and mortality rates have been incredibly low. Uh, Iceland, for instance, hasn't had a death from COVID in the entire country since May. Uh, and, and this is in, in the face of, of a Delta surge. So if you can achieve vaccination rates in the high 70s and, and low 80s, you're really going to, to weather uh, even a, a Delta variant surge quite well. Wow. You know, I think a lot of People might be hesitant as well because we just don't know about the origin of the virus. Dr. Lawler, what can you tell us about the alpha virus? Does not knowing the origins of the alpha virus complicate the world's ability to fight it? And what do we know? So a great question. And, and uh, just to make sure there's no confusion, the, the alpha variant of the virus is, is different from the original version of the virus that came out of Wuhan, and so you can call it the first virus as the alpha, uh, but that's a little different from the alpha variant, which was the one that arose in, in the UK in late 2020. But it, it's true that the origins of the virus are still um, hotly debated, and I think that um, there, there may never be a definitive answer about how the virus originated. Was it something that naturally emerged out of a, an animal host, which has happened with previous coronaviruses, or was it something that potentially escaped from a laboratory. Uh, I don't think we have definitive proof either way, uh, and we may never know. It, it's certainly important to try and find that answer for uh, biosecurity in the future so we can understand how to prevent this from happening again. But the reality is, at this point in the pandemic for us and what we need to do over the next several weeks and several months, it really doesn't make much of a difference. The, the tools that we have are still the tools that are going to work, the vaccines, most importantly, and then non-pharmaceutical interventions to uh, additionally limit community spread, things like wearing face masks, avoiding large crowds, uh, confined indoor spaces, testing, isolating known cases, quarantining those contacts. Those are the tools that are going to get us through these difficult times, uh, regardless of where the virus originally came from. You know, in your position, though, it's such an important one. Don't you want to know? I mean, aren't there people who are in your position, who you're working with at Asper, who are very curious as to the origin of the virus? Because how do we prevent this from potentially happening again? Oh, absolutely. It, it is critically important, uh, ultimately, if we can, to get to the bottom 
of the virus origin, where it came from, how it made its way into human populations, uh, and uh, what are the future implications for um, uh, protecting ourselves uh, from a similar event. So if it turns out that we can definitively show that this originated uh, in a species jump from an animal to a human, uh, then we obviously need to do a lot more to try and determine how we can predict those events and, and how we can prevent them from happening again. Clearly, we need to do that anyway because that risk uh, is among the most significant for future pandemics. But obviously, if it originated in, in a laboratory and was the, the result of a, an accidental escape from a lab, then we need to do a, a much more thorough review of our biosafety and biosecurity protocols to make sure that we're not going to uh, allow that opportunity to happen again. So yes, the, the, the origin of the virus is, is critically important. It's just not necessarily important for the steps we need to take from a public health perspective here in, in the next several weeks to months. And don't you think, James, that uh, in spite of that fact that we'll never really know, that we probably ought to do both of those things? We should redouble our efforts regarding safety and biosecurity in all of our research facilities and at the same time do everything we can to uh, limit what's known as zoonotic spread, spread from the wild kingdoms. Uh, absolutely, because regardless of how this virus originated, that threat still exists in both of those spaces. Uh, certainly we know that uh, in, in many ways, nature provides uh, the, the most severe threats and, and opportunities for uh, new emerging viruses or pathogens. But obviously, we, we need to make sure that we are doing everything we can to prevent uh, accidental escape uh, of pathogens from laboratories that are working with dangerous viruses and bacteria. I just can't imagine how difficult it must be to be in your position right now and wondering. I mean, you're doing such a great job. You look at that map, Nebraska, right in the middle of the country, is faring better than virtually every other state in the nation right now. And so you're doing things right in Nebraska, but I am sure that you're also wondering how do we keep this from happening again, just as many of us at home are. So it's interesting that we're in that situation. I do want to thank you both. I think Dr. Gold, this might be a good opportunity to share how there's a public private partnership and the government is involved in what you're doing and at UNMC because they believe in you. They believe in the science there. And talk about how the two of you even came together to begin with. Well, you know, it's amazing serendipity that we've been taking care of patients with highly infectious diseases for a very long time since our biocontainment unit was built almost 20 years ago. And of course it was done shortly after the 9-11 attacks when anthrax and shortly after that SARS uh, was uh, the big challenge uh, around the world and to some extent in the United States. But uh, you know a lot of our expertise was demonstrated in the Ebola days of 2014 and 2015 and you know when Dr. Lawler joined the team and the Global Center for Health Security continued to grow uh, through our relationships and largely through his relationships with the federal government, we were able to develop partnerships with the Department of Defense, with the part of the civilians, the Department of State, and so many others for education, for research, and for clinical care. And we are so privileged to have people such as Dr. Lawler and the Global Center team, members of our College of Public Health, who are at the forefront, literally at the cutting edge of trying to keep America safe. Uh, and it's so appropriate uh, for this show on the, uh, this holiday weekend to thank them and to recognize their contributions. Absolutely, and we thank you for your contributions as well. And it has been said that Omaha, Nebraska could be the next Silicon Valley of medicine. And both of you are at the forefront of what's happening there. Thank you both for joining us tonight. So grateful for you. Thank you at home as well. We'll see you next Monday right here on Rural Health Matters.